Life storms. You know, I struggled with with this at first because this this can be heavy. And you know, sometimes you just want to go to church and you just you want that that exciting message and that that pat on your back and let's it's almost like a pep rally. And you know, speaking of pep rallies, I've been telling Lula and she's not really in on this, but um Sometimes I think we ought to start church off with some God cheers and uh, have our cheerleaders or something come and, and our band or something just get us jived up and ready. But I can't wait till I walk down them, them golden streets and God's got the best band in, in the eternity. I mean, I cannot wait for it. So, But today it may not be that exciting fluff, but, you know, life it's not always great, is it? You know, I know that the good days usually outnumber the bad. It seems to keep coming up in conversation, but, you know, our God's good. But that doesn't mean life is going to be easy. Amen. So life storms. So we all agree that, that life is hard. Life is tough. You can, especially if you ever bring it up around the coffee shop, you can hear how hard it was. And thank God I didn't have to live through that. And uh, I've got some, I've got some things in life like uh, central heat and air. Praise God for that <laughs> in Texas. <laughs> but life is tough. There's pain, sickness, heartache, finances. Yuck, yuck, finances. Rejection, unforgiveness. Ouch. Life is tough. So there's three types of storms. And um, thanks, to, thanks, thanks to my wife here, as I'm going through this prepping for a sermon, it ended up being a, a, family, a family session. And word from God coming through my wife. And I just want to tell somebody here that um, this is not just the job of the man of the household. This is a family, just like our church is a family. It's a complete unit, and God's Word comes from all directions on it. Amen? So there's three types of life storms. There's storms that we engineer our own life storms. And then number two, there's where others engineer our life storms. And number three, Satan engineers our life storms. So there's three. The self-engineered life storm, it's your desires and your egos uh, that decide the path that you go, not God. You ever, you ever get on that path and like, no, I'm, I'm doing this. Uh, it's my way, God. I'll, I'll praise you and everything for it, and I'll, I'll give you the glory for it, but God, trust me on this, okay, God? You ever find yourself there? You don't have to answer. <laughs> I know it's true. <laughs> but a perfect example is Jonah. Look where it got him, in the belly of a fish. I mean, that got him in a bad place. And it can get us. It's gotten me, I know, many times in a bad place. And I know you can relate to Jonah in this. But... That's a self-engineered life storm. And then when others engineer your life storm, that, that's things that are out of your control. Um, you know, this community is, is made up of all different little cliques and little family units and different congregations and, and everything. But, you know, sometimes things can be out of your control, can be hitting you. You can be hit with tribulations from, from somebody else's actions. And it's easy to slip into poor me and kind of, you know, have that violin playing in the background and because it wasn't your fault. And so others can, can engineer a life storm that affects you. I know that children, children don't, don't get a say in, in the life that they get born into. Joseph, 
You see where he was. He was the youngest of 11 brothers he had. And, uh, I mean, Joseph, that was a storm caused by his brothers. I mean, dumped in a well, sold off. He's a perfect example of not wallowing in self-pity because somebody else made his storm. That's a whole sermon in itself. We're not going to go down that road, okay? But the one that I want to talk about today mostly is Satan has engineered life storms. And I know there's a lot of people that don't want to believe that, that Satan is, is real and out here and working. But he is. The fact is, is he is. He brings tragedy, heartache, pain. All these that come from Satan, they are the most painful, and they're the hardest to understand. Because you don't have a person to blame on some of these, these situations. Death. Our head pastor is dealing with this right now. A Satan-engineered life storm. So often those questions, when you're looking at a Satan-engineered life storm, I know we've all heard these questions, and these are hard to answer sometimes on the, on the spot. Why did God do this? Why did God allow this to happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? I know that has been floating around this church, this community, so much here lately. There's people that we love dearly in this congregation that are battling cancer, battling poverty, battling rejection. When they go into those schools, there's kids that battle rejection beyond what we have. I had, a, I had it pretty easy in my day. The kids nowadays are dealing with something totally different. And I believe that it's proof that Satan is alive and well on this earth. And he's coming down on God's people. So does God allow bad things to happen? Yes, he does. Because of two things. And I know it. there's probably somebody just went, <gasps> he said that. But yes, it's because of two things. There's free will in humans, which roll us back to number two on a self-made life storm. And number two, Satan is allowed to rule this earth until the second coming. Those are hard to swallow. They're not fun to hear, but it's true. So to back up Scripture on, on free will, it starts in Genesis 126. It says, God created humans in His image and likeness, giving them the capacity to display qualities such as love and justice and the ability to determine their future, also known as free will. And also Satan, he rules the earth. We find that in John, John 12, 31. I'm just backing this up. And the Word of God says in John 12, 31, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Satan will be driven out at the second coming. He will be defeated. That battle has already won. You can also find it in Ephesians 2, the first two verses in Ephesians 2. For as you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you, were followed, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He loves our flesh. He loves to get in there and mess things up. But he's active. He's working. Also in John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come 
that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, I heard that verse whenever I was a kid. I remember when my grandfather died unexpectedly. And, um, you know, I was tight with him. He took me coon hunting. We we were able to stay up past our curfew when, when Granddad took us out. And it was quite all right to come home after the sun came up with Granddad. But when he was taken by a heart attack, I, I struggled. I asked those questions. Why? God, why did you do that? Why? Why? And my mother brought me to this. For the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so she said that to me so many times that it gets written on your heart. And, you, and as you get older, you start understanding that, that this is the battleground. It's not just an easy walk through life. So this is a perfect example of this. Job. We've all heard about the patience of Job. And I think, man, the heartache of Job. The break that Job had to go through. I'm not going to read all of this, but we're going to hit, hit some high points in, in Job. But if in your, in your time, in your quiet time, go and read uh, Job 1, 6 through 22. But it starts with this. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. Where have you come from, said the Lord to Satan, from roaming through the earth? He replied, walking back and forth in it. It's proof he walks back and forth. He is active. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one on earth like him, a man who is blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. So to back up a little bit, Job, Job was probably like a Brazilianaire. And uh, that's a real word. But, um, you know, he was, God favored him. God, God blessed him. He had thousands of camels, donkeys, you name it, sheep, uh, servants. But he fears God and shuns evil. So, very well. Um, so Satan was like, well, you know what? He's blessed and all, but I, I think I could get him to curse you, curse your name. And, uh, yeah, he's got it all good, but you take all that away, he, I bet you he's going he's gonna to shun you. Or he's going he's gonna to curse your name. He said... Very well, if you want to try, said the Lord to Satan. Anything he has is, is in your hands, but you must not lay a hand on the man himself. And Satan went from, that, from the presence of the Lord. So from there, you go through those scriptures, and all of a sudden a servant comes into Job, and, and he says, okay, these, these bandits, they came and... and and they stole Job's oxen and his donkeys and killed all the servants that was with them. And then another one. I mean, it's just bam, bam, bam. Fire came from heaven and burned a thousand sheep and his servants. Just one got away to tell him. And then yet another one. Man, it's stole 3,000 camels and killed the servants that were there. All three occasions, it killed his servants. And then the final blow of this first chapter. Then all his children were at the eldest son's house having a feast. And a giant wind came, blew the house down, and killed them all. Devastation. I know we've all experienced devastation before. I'm just putting myself right there with Job. Devastation to the point where I bet words couldn't really come out. It would be groanings. 
And then in chapter 20, then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. How? How in that brokenness can you fall in worship? That starts before all this happened. That started with a relationship with a Savior, with a God above all gods, a name above all names. That started way before. And so when all else is gone, when all else has failed, when, when he's devastated, it's the first place he went. That didn't just start when things went bad. That started years before. When he fell to his knees and he worshipped, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord, got, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In his brokenness, blessed be the name of the Lord. Easier said than done, right? That doesn't make you broken and un, unuseful in the kingdom when you feel that way. That just means we've got work to do. We've got a relationship to build. This just came to me that, you know, whenever things are wrong as a child, when things are wrong, you go to mama or daddy when you're broken. It might be a first heartbreak or it might just be your first experience with rejection. Where, do, where does that child go? To mama or daddy. And they bury their face in their chest and they weep. Job had a daddy in heaven. Job went to his father and blessed his name when he was broken. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoings. And I'm just going to speak for my brother in Christ, Russ. Russ got devastated on Sunday morning last week. Russ has had an unbelievable relationship with his Father in heaven. Yes, we don't understand these things, but his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are above our ways. We don't understand it. It's funny how you can understand how a terrain goes and how a path goes whenever you're sitting up on a mountaintop, right? You can look down on it and see it. That's why on a battlefield, a lot of times those commanders were up high where they could see and they could send messengers to fight here, fight there. And it's a plan. It's a battlefield. But God's ways are above our ways. We're down in the battle. We can't see what's going on. And so I know that that there's devastation that, that Russ felt and has been feeling and is still going through. But talking to him over the phone, he still praises our Father. He still hangs on to his goodness and, in, and his grace. Because even though Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our Father comes so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So Satan engineered this life storm, but we have hope. I can't imagine what, what people feel like that, that don't understand this hope. In Romans 8, 24 and 25, it says, For this hope we are saved, but hope that is, is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they have already, uh, what they already have? 
But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And it's like faith. If we knew how things were going to lay out, why would we need faith? Why, why would we need to stand on faith? Why would we need to pour everything out to our, to our God in prayer if we knew all this? It's faith to follow and in Jeremiah 29, 11, I love this. I hang on to this scripture so much. And if you've, got, if you've got a notepad or anything that you can keep in your shirt pocket or your pants pocket, I would write this down. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that hope in that future is an eternity with Him. So life storms come no matter what. Our trust is in Him. I want to share this with you. And uh, I don't believe, if any of y'all know me, y'all know I don't believe in coincidences. Um, I serve a powerful God. And I do not, I do not believe in coincidences. And so this morning, um, Miss Brandy here, she sent me um, one of her devotionals that pop up every morning. And, uh, you know, when you're preparing for a sermon, sometimes you can doubt yourself a little bit here and there. But this is what was sent this morning. I, I've got to read this to you. He is with you. God often allows us to endure heavy storms in order for us to learn and grow in Him. In the storm, rather than asking, why God? What if we asked, what is, what is God teaching me through this trial? Whatever storm you're facing, be still and know that there is purpose in your pain. Our God turns beauty from ashes. Keep enduring and press into Him. He strengthens the weak and stands alongside them. He is with you. And in 2 Timothy 4.17 it says, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That's not a coincidence. That He's teaching me, even as I'm prepping, that even though these life's storms are here, He is with us. He will never forsake us. And I know that Miss Peyton's just getting started on this walk. Her, her eternity has just begun. And so she's going to see rough roads ahead. Because she's the daughter of, our, of the Most High God, and Satan's not going to like that. But you're strong in him, right? All right. You know, it's hard to, to move on from a life storm. But if you hold on to that wisdom that came with it, there's no telling how many people you can touch, how many people that you can help get through, how many people that God can minister to through you and through your experiences, through your loss and through your pain. So, just like we sang at the first of the service, count it all joy, like James said. Count it all joy. When the trials come, whenever the battle's raging, count it all joy because we serve an amazing God. Amen? Well, are we ready for a baptism? If the band wants to come up and, uh, and just play some music.